Hey, it's me again. So um, I'm going to lecture to you. Um, so just to make sure we're starting off all on the same page and actually doing the same lecture, I want to make sure that you guys have gone into the home canvas page, right? And you can get to the lecture two different ways, right? You guys are always checking your daily agendas right now. Distance learning is so much fun. Okay, so it's going to take us into our daily lecture, or I'm sorry, daily agendas for the class. And we are in week 10. So we're going to on that um and then once we get into week 10 it's going to show you like what we've been doing each and every single day and so we're just going to scroll right on down and you can see you guys had a warm-up today in canvas going over like hey what do you guys think of the quiz or the vocab quiz so before you do the lecture make sure you go and download the lecture on putting one note uh, the lecture into your OneNote, so that way you guys can take annotations along with this, unless you're just gonna watch me go through the lecture, then who cares? So, um, and then we're gonna go into step two, and we're actually gonna do the lecture. So the lecture that I'm going to be talking at you guys about today, you can find inside our World War I resources page. And so in the World War I resources page, you're going to make sure to click the lectures tab. So once you get the lectures to load, we're going to click Treaty of Versailles. And uh, it's really weird. And it's going to pop up Treaty of Versailles, all ready to go. Um, and then I've already pre-downloaded it into my OneNote. And but this is what's going to pop up. And here we go. So pardon me, because I'm going to use OneNote as if I was... Uh, on the whiteboard. So this is going to be a learning experience for us all. So the first uh, slide that we have here going on is just telling us or reminding us what it is that we are going to be learning about today. And that's going to be hitting on the state standards for 10.5 and 10.6. Um, but nobody got time for that. So the first thing I've got here is I'm introducing a picture to you guys going over the Treaty of Versailles. And inside here, this is taking place um, in the Palace of Versailles. And if you guys don't remember, this was during our French Revolution unit, French Revolution, if you guys remember Revolution. Um, and then on top of that, um, this was uh, not built by King Louis the 16th, but we saw this during King Louis the 16th, um, the Women's March on Versailles and things like that. Now, actually, inside, oh, come on, go away. Okay, so inside here, sorry about this, guys, it's just like we're at school. Um, you're going to see um, all of these grumpy old white men. And these are going to be considered the big three. So inside this meeting, uh, we're going to see POTUS. I know you guys remember that me that means uh, President of the United States of America or po President of the United States. So we're going to see President Woodrow Wilson in this photo. Um, that's this guy right here. This is Woodrow Wilson. Um, we're also going to see uh, the French Premier or Prime Minister. Um, his name is George or Georges Clemenceau. Okay, and then we're also going to see uh, the United Kingdom Prime Minister, and that is going to be David Lloyd George. Okay, all of these were your vocabulary words. Okay, and you guys took a quiz on that in the last few days from 9.4. So what we got going on here is we're just going to review the end of the war. Now, because school left off at such a weird spot, you guys are not really going to remember Russia. Um, but this is the only information you need to know because we skipped chapter 9.3. So this is the only info you need to know. Okay, um, Russia doesn't do a whole lot in the war. They're going to hit a major hiccup in March of 1917. There's going to be a Russian revolution. This too was one of your vocabulary words. Okay, um, the king, uh, Nicholas II, or Tsar Nicholas II, he's going to abdicate. Alexander Kerensky is going to take over. There's going to be something called the provisional government. All of this is going to help you in our next unit. 
So maybe you might want to come back to this uh, because our next unit is on the French Revolution. I'm sorry, the Russian Revolution. Um, but the only things that you need to know for this particular um, content, uh, the November Revolution erupts nine months later. Uh, Vladimir Lenin, he's going to be one of my favorite people to talk to you guys about. He's going to lead the Bolsheviks or Russian communists to take over Russia. Um, there's going to be another vocabulary word in the future, Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Um, this I actually kind of take back as something you're going to need to know for your unit test when we eventually take it. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk pulls Russia out of World War I. And we should remember that this is all because of the failed battle at Gallipoli. Um, if you recall from what we talked about in class, Gallipoli is going to be the Ottoman Empire versus the French and the English, as well as the Anzac troops. And they're trying to defeat the Ottoman Empire so that they can give a supply line up into Russia. So it's this failed battle at Gallipoli. Um, but because the Allies lose, uh, Russia is going to end up pulling out of the war. So we also need to make sure that the United States, uh, we know that the United States comes into the war. So the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915, um, about 128 Americans die on that ship, including a very wealthy American citizen um, with the last name of Vanderbilt. Um, so Germany promises to stop their unrestricted submarine warfare. They're going to play by the rules. And of course, within two years, they're going to break those rules. They send a secret telegram to Mexico asking Mexico to attack the United States and keep us out of the war. If you guys remember uh, from our documentary we watched, this was all about territory. Germany offered Mexico the ability to take back uh, not only Texas, but I believe Arizona as well as New Mexico. And if Mexico kept us busy, this would be their reward. And the United States intercepts this and they say not on our watch. So now we're going to drone in World War I. Um, so now let's get into the end of the war. Um, you guys listened to a podcast earlier this week on a Spanish flu. It's the supposition or like the guess that the Spanish flu, which is not actually from Spain, Come on. Okay. Uh, hastened the end of the war because it hit the central powers hard first. And then, um, okay. Um, and that allowed the allies uh, the ability to crush uh, the central powers. So Germany is going to surrender. Um, we're going to have an armistice. This is one of your vocabulary words. So this armistice. Um, is signed for November 11th, 1918 at 11 a.m. This is going to signal the end of the war. All other central powers surrender earlier in 1918 um, because because they saw the end, but what it comes down to is Germany was the last holdout, um, which is probably why Germany is going to get some of the roughest treaties uh, among all of the central powers. So Germany holds out the longest. Okay. Um, France is angry at Germany, and I don't think angry is the right word. They're very angry. And then so is England. They're less angry than France, but they're still very angry as well. Um, so just kind of keep that mind going into the end of the war when we're dealing with this treaty. Uh, France and England owe a lot of money to the United States. Um, they had to borrow money. Um, because remember, we were out of the war uh, from 1914 to 1917. So we were sending them money. We were also sending them supplies. Um, this means arms, right? Or guns. They weren't literally giving people's arms away. Uh -huh. uh, just because we're not together doesn't mean I'm not going to tell you corny jokes. Um, so there were two proposed treaties. And the first proposed treaty comes to us from one of your vocabulary words, right? American President Woodrow Wilson. And American President Woodrow Wilson was like, hey, let's take a look at my treaty called the 14 points. It's called the 14 points because you guessed it. There are 14 points that we should all abide by. Um, and so this was considered a more peaceful approach 
to the end of the war as opposed to what France and England had in store. So when we're looking at what are the themes for this particular treaty, democracy, Okay, the right to vote for your leader. This is really incredibly important. This is still a new idea. Um, you have something called self-determination. Self-determination is one of your vocabulary words. And I'm really sorry to remind you, it's a poster in my wall. It's the right to create your own country and not be owned by a European nation. Now, we need to go over this. And I don't want to sound racist, but I want to make sure you guys know that this applies to uh, white nations only. Okay. This does not apply to all of those colonies that Europe owns all over the world. Um, this is incredibly important, um, especially because um, we're going to have the mandate system after this. So does not apply um, to, ah, pardon me. Okay colonies around the world. Okay, so um, what this would apply to are places like Bosnia. Okay, um, this would also apply to all of these fun places that you guys labeled at the beginning of the year on our new map that aren't going to be countries yet, but they will become countries um, like Croatia. Um, Let's see here, Kosovo, okay, and we're not there yet, but uh, Czechoslovakia, these are all new countries that are going to be born out of these major European empires. Um, so they have the right to create their own country and create their own government. Um, so uh, Woodrow Wilson is asking for more honesty among nations, stop secret treaties, uh, fat chance, but it's the idea. Uh, and then something that was also your vocabulary word is something called the League of Nations. It's an international peacekeeping organization to prevent uh, future world wars. So when we come out of this, um, the United States Congress doesn't approve much of anything, but they also don't approve the League of Nations. When the League of Nations is created after the war, the U.S. Uh, does not join. Okay. Our Congress says that we should not be held to foreign rules and we should not be forced to join wars just because we signed a piece of paper. So uh, the League of Nations, and we can go over this on another slide, is going to be weak sauce. Okay. It's going to have no power. And the United States isn't a part of it. Um, all it's going to be able to do is shake a finger and say, shame, shame. So um, England and France also don't like how nice this treaty is to Germany. But what we're coming down to is we want to prevent future wars. And it's really hard to prevent future war if you give someone harsh consequences, because at the end of the day, if you're giving someone really harsh consequences, what does it matter? Right. Like they've already been punished. They might as well do what they want. Um, so unfortunately, what we're looking at that does happen oopsie, is the harshest treaty of them all is going to be the Treaty of Versailles. And so I do want to remind you guys when we're talking about why we call treaties uh, places or we name them after things, it's because that's the place that they were signed. Okay, and the Treaty of Versailles is also one of your vocabulary words, so let's make sure to pay uh, attention. So it is a treaty that punishes Germany. Um, like I said over here, it's harsh, 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 harsh. Um, there's actually a direct correlation that this treaty is going to end up causing uh, World War II, but we'll get into that in future units. Um, it is a treaty that Germany was forced to sign by both France and England. Uh, so the United States actually doesn't approve ratify this treaty either. We make a separate treaty with them. But this is the treaty that they were forced to sign with uh, France and England, who you have to remember are very super angry uh, with Germany. So Germany is not allowed to have a big military. And when we kind of break this down, they could only have an army with 100,000 men or less. Okay, that's not a lot of people at all. Um, on top of it, they could have uh, no, what was it? Um, uh, no Air Force. 
Um, they could also have no Navy, uh, no tanks, basically anything that they were really successful with with World War I was 100% taken away. Uh, when we talk about their Navy, they were ha allowed to have a fleet of ships, but I believe they only had about 10 ships uh, in total. Um, so Germany was not allowed to own colonies anymore. So all of this was all of their overseas colonies. Um, so they owned a lot of property, quote unquote, in Africa. So overseas colonies in Africa, uh, we are, they have to give these places up. They have to give up. Um, really cool fun fact. There are um, a lot of countries in Africa where their population grew up speaking German. And then after World War I, they were run mostly predominantly by the British. And so then you've got this generational difference in African individuals, depending on the country. Um, more, more specifically, Tanzania um, is an example where I had a student, she grew up Br uh, speaking British English and her grandparents had grown up speaking German. Um, and she never understood why. So if you guys are interested, you can look into that. Uh, but they have to give up all of their colonies they're not allowed to own them anymore. Um, and a lot of these become, uh, they become something called a mandate. And we will talk about that in a future slide. So um, Germany also had to take full blame for the war, the war guilt clause, Article 231. Um, this is by far the most important part of the tree that you do need to make sure you know about. Um, this is 100% going to be on your test, but it's going to be on any test. And it's something that is still referenced in pop culture today. Um, Germany had to take blame for starting the war, even though they didn't kill Archduke Franz Ferdinand, even though they didn't um, declare war first. And even though they didn't move their troops first, Germany has to take full blame for the entire war. And a lot of this goes back to the fact that they were fighting the longest. Um, and that's why it's called the war guilt clause as well. Um, now Germany also had to pay reparations, which, um, indemnities is just a reference to our imperialism unit, but rape, uh, reparations are, is going to be a vocabulary word and it's payments, um, that you owe as the loser, you're going to owe them to the winner, um, because of all of the, the damage that you did during the war. So Germany has to pay money of 30 b -b 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 billion dollars to the allied powers, um, and if I'm not mistaken, I want to say Germany finished paying those payments back in somewhere around 2010. Um, but basically, this payment was meant to bankrupt Germany. Um, and it does. Um, it wanted to weaken Germany so bad that they would never be able to declare war again. Um, now, obviously, that didn't work because Hitler, but um, the idea was to weaken them uh, uh, so badly that no world war could ever happen again. World war. Okay. Now, another part or provision of the treaty that isn't inside the slide that I want to make sure um, I talk about is the separation... Um, you know what? No, I lie. Never mind. These are the big major parts um, that I want to go over. So when we look at this newspaper clipping, um, these are the full terms of the trees, PD. So you've got the ex Kaiser. Um, he is one of your vocabulary words, right? Kaiser. Um, I think this time around I anglicized it and it's William the second, but don't forget it's Wilhelm. Okay. Um, so he's going to be tried by an international tribune um, because of committing a crime. Now, I do want to front load this word. The word is abdicate. Okay. Abdicate. Um, it means to give up your throne. And um, we can say very nicely that the king of Germany gave up his throne, or we can say that he fled um, because he does. He flees to the Netherlands. Um, gives up his throne and calls it pe uh, calls it quits. Um, Germany must pay for all war loss and damage, uh, both money in kind to her final limit. 
Um, this also means that they're giving widows pensions because their husbands died and aren't coming home and aren't going to be able to pay the bills. Um, but it's also about rebuilding the cities that were absolutely destroyed, whether it was the Zeppelins bombing them or it was the troops moving into those cities along the, the trenches. So you've got colonies, Alsace and Lorraine, that piece of territory that was on the border of France and Germany that kept going back and forth. Um, all of that's going to be lost. Once again, you have the army and the navy are reduced to skeletons. The air force and U-boats are absolutely prohibited because Germany was a beast with, during the war with those. And then territory west of the Rhine is going to be occupied for 15 years by the Allies as a guarantee. And we'll talk about that more when we get into our unit on World War II with Hitler. But I just want to refresh your guys' memory. You've got Luxembourg. We have Belgium. We have Netherlands, and then over here we have France, and this is all going to be Germany, okay? Um, at the start of our unit, I talked about this little piece of land called Alsace and Lorraine that the two countries had fought about, but now what we're going to be discussing is this whole area uh, this whole area is going to be called the Rhineland. And it's called the Rhineland because of something called the Rhine River. Uh, and Germany is not going to be allowed to have any military troops in this area on the border between France and Germany. Uh, and Hitler is going to defy that. But we'll, we'll come back to that in a couple of weeks. So once again, that's just going over the Treaty of Versailles that England and France sign with Germany. When we're looking at the people that are involved, remember these guys, these are all your vocabulary words, David Lloyd George, K. Georges Clemenceau, and Woodrow Wilson. And because your textbook sucks, they don't really talk about Italy and Victoria Orlando, but he's involved. Um, when we're looking at people who weren't invited, Vladimir Lenin was not invited whoopsie, um, because he was back home uh, busy killing his own people in the Russian Revolution. And then Germany's not invited because Kaiser Wilhelm fled. Um, and then this is going to be super important. Some, the new government that comes to power in Germany is called the Weimar government. Now, I know you guys are looking at me crazy, but in the German language, a W is pronounced with a, like as a V in the English language. So the Weimar government. And this is just to kind of like front load this, but I want you to take this uh, without any anti-Semitic feeling. Um, it will be perceived as a Jewish government in the future. In this moment, in 1919, not a Jewish government, but Hitler will refer back to it as a Jewish government and how it hurts the German people. So I just want to kind of throw that out there for you. Um, when we come down to this, this once again is just looking at like, hey, this is what the treaty states again. So um, like a star circle highlight moment is that the treaty is designed to cripple Germany militarily, territorially, and economically. Here we come to the specifics of uh, the armed forces and what's happening to Germany's military. Okay, this is that map or that I drew above, right? So when we're saying that the Rhineland has to be demilitarized, there's no military personnel allowed at all. So this is no army, no troops, no nothing. Uh, German national territory, they lost all the territory abroad that they had conquered during this war. Poor Belgium that had been ransacked, Denmark. And then um, you've got everything on their east goes to create Poland. That's kind of nice. Um, all the German overseas territories are going to be lost. And then reparations, they have to pay money. And then this was one that I kind of stuttered about earlier. No union with Austria. This is going to get us into trouble when we come back to World War II. We're going to reference this again. And then the biggest, saddest part of this all is going to be the war guilt clause. Uh, Germany had to accept the blame for starting World War I, even though, once again, they did not kill Archduke Franz Ferdinand. They had no skin in the game between um, Bosnia, Serbia, and Austria-Hungary. Um, they didn't declare war first. They didn't move their troops first. 
um, but they still had to take full blame. So um, when we come back to that, we've got a uh, fallout. Italy is upset because they didn't get all of the land they wanted. Um, Italy, I do want to remind you guys, because we haven't really been there in class to discuss it. They are uh, lovers. They are not fighters. Um, just like the Russians during the war, um, they don't really win a lot. They kind of just exist. Um, even though there are repeated battles, they don't really gain a lot of land. They're not really fantastic, but um, they're there. So that's helpful. Um, but they're upset because they didn't get everything that they wanted, especially land from Austria. Um, Japan's upset because they didn't get all the land that they wanted either. They were feuding against uh, China and Russia. Who cares? Um, Southeast Europe, Europe is broken up into four different countries. Okay. This is this self-determination part again. Um, so this is your vocabulary word. And we want to make sure we know that this applies only to Europeans, um, people of white descent. This does not apply to the colonies all over the world. And that's actually going to cause a lot of problems because the people who fought for these European countries, they're colonizers. Um, they thought that they would earn their freedom and they don't. Um, and it's at this point, the Ottoman Empire becomes Turkey. The Ottoman Empire is no more. And then mandates, this is honestly, I think the hardest concept out of this whole chapter. Um, mandates are countries that Germany had previously owned that are now owned by the League of Nations. So these are the countries that join the League of Nations. The United States is not a part of it. France is going to own Syria and Lebanon. Um, so if you guys know anyone of Syrian or Lebanese descent, uh, their grandparents are going to parlez-vous français um, because the French owned them. Um, now they didn't get to say that they were their colonizers, but they got to take advantage um, politically, economically, socially, culturally in these countries. It's imperialism part two. Um, England got to take control over Iraq, Transjordan and Palestine and Israel. And this this is the huge argument that I kind of brought up in class. Um, remember that Palestine um, is going to be a term that most people that are Muslims are going to be using. Um, and Israel are going to be people of, uh, of Jewish descent. People who are Jewish will refer to it as Israel, but it is the same exact place. There's just a larger fight over who owns it and why. Um, something else that we're going to have to make sure we're studying on our own is you guys just finished getting quizzed on this World War I map of Europe. And then this right here is going to be your new map. So I want to make sure that you guys kind of take time to review. Um, you're going to have Finland is going to be established, Poland, um, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Czechoslovakia, little tiny Austria and little tiny Hungary like we're used to. Um, Yugoslavia is going to pop in for a little bit, but otherwise you guys know this map through and through. Um, so don't get too scared. Oh, wait, my bad. Turkey comes back. Um, so make sure um, that you get ready for that. Um, and then these are just pictures of the mandates. Um, so that way you guys can see this is uh, the former Ottoman Empire. Oops, let's write this over here. Okay, former Ottoman Empire. And if you guys kind of remember from uh, one of your assignments weeks ago, this is what T.E. Lawrence was sent in to go do anyway, right? He was sent in to the Ottoman Empire to disrupt them and to ask the Arab princes to revolt against their leader. And that would hopefully crumble the Ottoman Empire from the inside out, causing them to withdraw from the war. Um, and so you've got these new countries, kind of, not really, um, but colonies that have been created. And the biggest one that we need to pay attention to because it is 100% um, relevant today is going to be Palestine. Um, so that's all I have for my lecture here. I know that was really long and really boring and I want to apologize. And um, I hope that helps you guys make sense of the textbook. And if it doesn't, just always send me an email and um, I miss you guys and I wish I could lecture in person. I hope you're all doing okay. Bye.